You've probably heard that step one is all about basic science, while step two focuses on clinical knowledge. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm Alec Palmerton, and as someone who scored in the top 0.1% on step one and has helped many students succeed on both exams, I can tell you that the deeper differences are what really matter for scoring higher. In this video, I'll reveal the critical differences most people overlook, share a student's journey from step one failure to 270 plus on his step two CK NBMEs, and uncover the single most important insight about how step two questions should feel. If you're serious about acing these exams, let's jump in. Critical difference number one is what we call signal versus noise. So in education, there is this concept of signal versus noise. Signal means that they're giving you information that is meant to lead you towards the right answer, right? It's there basically to lead you towards the right path. In contrast, noise is something that's there to really distract you. And so if you think about this from a test writer standpoint, right, a test that has a lot of signal is going to be something that really isn't trying to confuse you, whereas one that has a lot of noise is going to have distractors and other things that are going to try to lead you astray. Now, in general, step one questions have a lot of signal and pretty clear signal and not a lot of noise. In contrast, step two questions tend to have a lot more noise and, if anything, the signal is going to be weaker. So, for example, on step one, diagnosis questions tend to be some of the easiest questions because they will give you a lot of the classic descriptions. So someone that has, say, a myocardial infarction is going to have you know, the classic chest pain that radiates to the left shoulder, or to the jaw, they're, they might have ST elevations, they're gonna have clear troponins, right? And they're not gonna have a lot of other medical problems. In contrast, step two is going to have less strong signal, meaning maybe they're going to have this sort of vague epigastric pain, right? Not the classic sort of, you know, left-sided chest pain. And maybe they're not gonna give you very clear EKG changes, right? Maybe it's just T-wave inversions. Maybe they're gonna have an existing left bundle branch block, so it's gonna be hard to see. Right, but for whatever reason, it's not going to be as clear, right, that this is the classic signal for an MI. In addition to that, step two questions tend to have a lot more noise. So if you've ever noticed, just about everyone on step two for an MI has, say, GERD, right, and wondered, why does that make sense? Oftentimes it's because they're trying to muddy the waters, right? There are other things that can give you chest pain, gastroesophageal reflux right, can give you chest pain. And so it's not uncommon for them to give you alternative diagnoses in the question stem that are gonna make it harder for you to spot the real diagnosis. And so the first difference of signal versus noise is critical for you to understand if you're going to be able to get more questions correct on step one and on step two, because as we'll talk about in a little bit, these differences are going to set a clear difference in the expectations you should have and how questions should feel on the exam. The second big difference is about question types and question distributions. One of the biggest differences is in what they call the physician task. And so there's obviously different ways that you can slice and dice the task, right? They've, they've got physician task, and then they've got system, and then they've got discipline. So I think one of the most instructive ways to look at the exam is to look at the physician task. And so on step one, 60 to 70% of the questions are what we call applying foundational science concepts. And so if you've watched our video on the NBME test writer secrets, where we go through and talk about the secrets behind how it is they write step one and step two questions, this is critical, okay? On the US MLEs in general, they're really, really clear about wanting you to actually apply foundational science principles and nowhere is this more clear than on step one. And so you can see it here, 60 to 70% of the questions are applying foundational science concepts. You can also see it, as we'll talk about in a little bit, in the, in the largest system, right? If you look at like cardiology or respiratory or things like that, the largest system is actually what they call general principles. I even was told once by someone who wrote questions for step one in the pathology section, roughly half of them are what they call general principles, right? So it's not something that's just a random detail. So one of the most important things to recognize this is that they're really, really upfront with this, both in the way that they write the questions and in the the breakdown of the material on the exam, that they are trying to test you on concepts. Note too, that for diagnosis, it's only about 20 to 25% of the test. As everyone knows for step two, so much more of it is based on clinical application of these concepts. Let me give you some examples. So whereas up to 25% of the test for step one is diagnosis, up to 46% of the test for step two is diagnosis. And for management, which is the pharmacology interventions and management section, up to 38% of the test is that. So if you think about it, almost up to 90% of the test is either the diagnosis or management, which is a big difference from the up to only 25% of 
of it for step one. This is relevant because oftentimes people will ask because step two questions tend to be a lot longer. They'll ask, should I, in order to try to cut down the amount of time that it takes for me to read the question, should I read the question first and read the answer choices first and then go back and try to like find sort of the buzzwords? A, consider the fact that there's a lot more noise and a lot less signal for step two, and B, recognize that up to 90% of the time you're going to read a question that says either what's the diagnosis or what's the next step in management, then for the most part, it's actually not that helpful in my experience to read the question first. Instead, what you should do is you should try to make sure that you understand what every single sentence means relative to the others. And for more tips on this, be sure to check out our video on how the NBME writes questions so that you can get more information on this, which I'll leave the description in the show notes. If you like finding the fundamental differences behind concepts, just like you do between step one and step two, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons. The third biggest difference is in the content organization and the emphasis. So what's interesting is, is that for the most part, the actual breakdown in terms of systems isn't that different between step one and step two. There's some subtle differences. So for example, in step one, cardiology is, you know, five to 9% of the test. Whereas in step two, it's actually a little bit more, but for the most part, the actual system level differences is not that large. What I think most people don't realize is, is that there's a lot of content on step one that actually comes back on step two that they weren't expecting. For example, biochemistry and immunology are classic examples of subjects where people are like, oh, this is just stuff that I have to memorize. These are just like random enzymes or random immunodeficiencies or things that I just needed to learn and cram for step one, but I'll never see again in my clinical practice and certainly never see on my shelf exams or step two CK. What they find is actually different and what they find is, is that actually a lot of that information does come back. The major difference is, is that it just isn't as heavily emphasized. So for example, even something as rare as say like biochemical disorders or immunodeficiencies will still come up in step two. They just happen to be in a clinical context like for example, in pediatrics. And you can also see this in the way that it's broken down in terms of the material by discipline. So in the immunology section, it's about six to 11% of step one. Whereas in step two, it's still present, right? It's just about half of that. So about three to 5%. What that means though, is, is that if you wanna score really, really, really high on step two, you have to try to get as many points as possible, including some of these supposedly lower yield subjects. And so it actually benefits you to really understand how to score well on these subjects for step one, because they can be the difference between scoring, you know, sort of middle of the pack to scoring a really high score on step two. This is also corroborated by the fact that the single biggest predictor of people's step two scores was actually their step one score score back in the days before step one was pass fail. And so again, another way to help you boost your step two score is actually to really understand the fundamental concepts and principles of step one. The fourth biggest difference between step one and step two is the subjective experience and the expectations that you should have going into the exam. So we mentioned in the beginning that step one has a lot stronger signal and very little noise, whereas step two has a lot more noise and the signal is typically weaker. I think when people feel uncertain about a question, right? We all will read questions or we'll read a sentence and we'll be like, okay, I don't really know what's going on. Like, I don't, I know that I should probably know that or, you know, like I feel sort of uncertain or I feel sort of uncomfortable while I'm reading this vignette. On step one, that's often because they're describing it in words that we don't understand or maybe we just don't understand the concept as well as we would like, right? So for step one, if you feel the subjective experience of being uncomfortable, there's a reason, right? And it's usually because they're sort of telling you an unnecessary detail, but it's still true, right? Or there's something that's like, you know, that like we just don't understand yet. In step two, it's important to recognize that if you feel uncertainty or if you feel doubt, then it actually is a feature, not a bug. In other words, the test writers are actually trying to basically confuse you by adding more noise to the question. So practically what this means is, is that the people that are scoring really, really high in step one, oftentimes will walk out and they'll tell me, wow, that was a really fair test. Like I understood what they were getting at. They were really getting a concept. It was really clever how it is that they were really testing me on these different principles. Whereas the people that walk out of step two and they end up scoring say two sixties or even higher on their exam, they'll usually tell me, hmm, I mean, I gave it my best shot, but it actually didn't feel like I could end up doing really poorly or I could do really well. I'm actually not sure. And what's interesting is, is that the first time you, you'll hear that, you're like, oh, well, I don't know, maybe that's just 
how it is that that one person felt, right? Maybe that's just an anecdote. But the more that I hear this, the more that I've come to believe that this is actually a feature of step two, right? For example, the NBME used to publish data on if you, you know, took your NBME a week before your exam, what was your final score? For step one, the width or the spread of the scores was actually really, really tight. So in other words, it was pretty rare to see someone score above or below by about five or 10%. Scoring difference than like five or 10% was, was actually pretty uncommon. Whereas step two, it was actually really common. It was something like maybe 23 or 20% of people would score 20 points or higher on their real exam than they had on the NBME leading up to their test. So this is really important to recognize that feeling uncertain is a normal part of the step two CK experience. Because I think a lot of people, myself included, if we are uncertain about something or if something doesn't quite feel right, then we we think, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? Oh, maybe I don't really know this as well as I think, and we'll eliminate that answer choice. Whereas really that was the right answer. You have to go in and ask yourself, okay, well, which of the answers is a good answer as opposed to which of these answers is perfect? And this brings us to our final difference between step one and step two, which is the test taking mindset that you have to have to do well on step one is different than the test taking mindset you need to have on step two. So in step one, seeking the perfect answer is something that is possible. It's an attainable goal. You'll, you'll never do it, right? Because there's always things that they can ask you that you wouldn't necessarily know, but it's at least something that is in the feasible realm of possibility because generally they're not trying to mislead you. The more that you feel like, oh my gosh, this fits, this fits, this fits, the more likely it is that you're on the right path and you're gonna get the questions right. Like for example, when I walked out of step one, I remember thinking, wow, I think I did, like I, I tend to not be a very cocky or confident person when I walk out of an exam, but I remember thinking, hmm, I think I did pretty well on that test. And if I didn't, I must've had a really, really bad sense of self-awareness or like I really didn't know what was going on because most of it just kind of fit, like it just made sense. Whereas for step two, because they're not going to give you the perfect answer, you have to go in with a mindset of, not letting perfect be the enemy of good. So we see this a lot. So for example, we had a student who failed step one and in under two months, he had basically transformed his approach and scored in the 260s on his NBMEs before he ultimately retook it and passed it. One of the things that he struggled with on shelf exams in step two, at least initially, was that he was like, oh, I don't understand. I keep getting these questions wrong, but I, I've studied them and I know this well, but I'm still getting them wrong and I don't really understand why. We sort of pulled back the curtain and we looked at how it is that he was doing questions. He was basically looking for flaws in his answer. So an example would be, let's say that there was a Kleinfelter patient and he was like certain that this was Kleinfelter syndrome, but the patient wasn't tall. And he was like, well, classically, Kleinfelter patients are tall and so, I don't understand, ah, there must be something I don't really get about this. And he would eliminate that answer choice because it wasn't perfect. It didn't fit with his ideal classic version in his head. And instead he would choose something where the answer was like something where the I don't know, the condition, like they, they weren't tall. The issue is, is that the test writers know what the classic pictures are and they know that you know the classic pictures at this point. And so they're going to, they're just feeding you noise. And so they need to make, right? If diagnosis questions make up almost 50% of the exam, they need to make them more difficult. At least some of them, they need to make you know pretty difficult. The way that they're going to do that is by using noise to kind of throw you off the scent. And so that you can't just scan and find one buzzword because if you scan and you are looking and you try to find one buzzword, maybe that buzzword was the noise answer. And so that's how a lot of people end up getting questions wrong, right? Even if they, they end up knowing it. And so the, the biggest change that this student made, he was scoring kind of like borderline honors or like maybe 70. He made a pretty big jump to like 86 and then 90 on his last two shelf exams once he realized that all he had to do was choose the good answer, but not the perfect answer. Because every time he tried to choose the perfect answer, he would eliminate it because he'd find some sort of flaw in it. And then he would just sort of by default choose the next best answer, which you know he wasn't really critical at all of. And he would just kind of choose it by default and he would get the question wrong. As soon as he started to compare the answers side by side and say, hmm, okay, well, you know, most of this fits with Kleinfelter syndrome except for this one part where they're not tall versus like eh, maybe they're this you know this fits with the fact that they're not tall but none of the other things fit 
it became a lot more obvious what the right answer was because he had changed his expectations, which allowed him to change his approach in terms of answering the question. The final key critical thing, especially if you are transitioning to shelf exams in step two to remember is, is that if you're struggling with translating what it is that you know to get more questions correct, consider that maybe you're being too critical of one answer and try to compare the answers side by side to find the good but not perfect answer. Now that you know the differences between step one and step two CK, you're ready to tackle the USMLEs. But to truly conquer these exams, you need to think like the test writers. In this next video, USMLE question writing hacks will reveal the secrets NBME test writers use when making questions for step one, step two, and shelf exams. So if you wanna take your scores to the next level faster, be sure to click on this video now.